Hi there. My name is Joshua Yearsley. Uh, I'm an editor and developer at Leader Games, and today I'm going to present User Research in Board Games, a post-mortem of Root. So, Root is a board game. Uh, it was released in 2018, um, and the basic idea behind this game is it's an asymmetric strategy game. Um, you play it on one of four sides. You either play as the cats, the birds, um, the Woodland Alliance, which is a collection of mice, foxes, bunnies, and generally the small woodland creatures, or the Vagabond, this wily raccoon character. And each one of these sides plays quite differently from the other. They all have different victory conditions, um, and they all interact in a way where um, each of them is kind of a check on another in an interesting way. You can kind of think of it like a Starcraft of board games. Highly asymmetric, highly strategic. And so today I'm going to basically talk about my role in doing usability and user experience work on this game and some of the lessons uh, that I've learned during that process and some takeaways for the rest of you. Uh, and at this point I would normally talk about like what is usability, what is user experience, but uh, I know that you're all quite an expert audience so I don't really need to go over that. So let's jump into uh, to both the good and the bad experiences, uh, and kind of what we can take away from it and what we can learn. So let's hop in. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about icon testing. So for many of you this topic will be familiar, um, but for some of you um, maybe not. So uh, as in many board games, um, Brute has a lot of icons, uh, and here's one of them. Or I, I should say that here was one of them. This is an old icon, um, and uh, you may be, may be wondering, well, what is this icon? Uh, to some of you, it will obviously be a mouse, but for a lot of people, when we would go up to them and ask them what this looked like, they would give us all sorts of funny answers. Some would say it's a teapot, or a monkey, or a ghost, um, but... As I said before, it's a mouse. Um, it's one of the four suits that we use on our cards. So we have the foxes, the rabbits, the mice, and the birds. Um, and so this is a problem, right? You know, people are not understanding what this icon means. And if somebody doesn't understand what an icon means, they're going to have a harder time learning what the game uh, is about and learning how the game plays. And here's the new icon. So the icon above is the one that Root ended up shipping with. Um, and uh, people people got it. People understood that it was a mouse. Um, our artist, Kyle Farron, uh, really, really did not want to make this change, though, um, to the point where even now we use this uh, uh, monkey mouse thing as a touchstone whenever Kyle says, monkey mouse now uh, he's referring to uh, something that he really doesn't think is a good idea uh, but you know we would go around and we would show off this new icon to people we would check whether people understood what the new uh, icon meant and just like undoubtedly people understood that this was a mouse so you know this is a win right well, you know, this is a uh, mostly a presentation about um, bad decisions and lessons learned, so, spoiler alert, uh, it was not a good decision. And I'm just going to show you why. And I'm not going to tell you why, I think that you're going to get it here pretty soon. So here's uh, the mouse icon and the bunny icon. And you make it a bit smaller, and you make it a bit smaller... Make it a bit smaller, and I think that you're starting to see the problem here, which is it does not scale well. So even though um, the new mouse icon was much more recognizable as a mouse, um, it was unfortunately not distinguishable from the bunny at all the scales that we were looking at. And the main reason why here is that the defining feature of what made the mouse into a mouse, that is the whiskers, are just are the smallest element of this icon. And so even though uh, at card scale, when you, you have this card up pretty close to your face, 
um, you know, you can make out the whiskers just fine. Um, when you have different backgrounds and smaller scales, especially on our map, um, the whiskers just kind of blend into the background. And so all of this information is lost. Um, and so this was a, ended up being a big mistake. It's unfortunately we can't really go back and fix it because it would interfere with expansion products. Um, but the, this was a mistake, um, not keeping uh, both recognizability and distinguishability in mind um, when it comes to icons in your games. Thankfully, you can still find our old friend, the monkey mouse, uh, hiding out in our logo without the monkey tail. Um, but if you ever need to visit uh, Kyle's old friend, you can go and look at our box. So sorry about that, Kyle. Bad decision there. Uh, and how this relates to the broader scope of games, um, what comes to mind to me is uh, augmented reality games. So um, in many video games that we have now um, that are just played on screens, you can very tightly control you know, what's being shown on the screen, what the background looks like. Um, you have a lot of control over your setting, and so you understand the context in which your icon is sitting. Um, but a much more challenging situation than submerging are alternate reality games, like in this case Pokemon Go, where the background can be quite a variety of situations, right? You know, it can be a street, it can be a dark room, um, you know, it could be a beach. Um, and so thinking about context and background and scale um, are going to become more and more important as we uh, progress and start developing more augmented reality games. So the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, storytelling and feedback. Um, so Roots fundamentally is a game about telling stories. Uh, you know, I mentioned before that you have these four factions, you have these cats, these the Woodland Alliance, you have the birds, and this Vagabond. And it's really a game not just about warfare and strategy, but also about politics. Uh, it tries to think about how power is transferred throughout societies, how governments gain and lose legitimacy, and things of that nature. Um, and so we have to tell some like pretty heady, pretty intricate stories using just some board game components. Um, and I'm going to show you one way how we get that right and one way how we get that wrong. So this uh, humble token in the game is called the Sympathy Token. Um, and it's a token of the Woodland Alliance, that uh, conglomeration of uh, small woodland creatures that I mentioned before. They're sort of like the rebel alliance of this game. Um, and a fun property of this token is that basically if you kill this token, if you remove it from the map, you go up and hit it, um, you're going to have to hand over a card to the Alliance. Um, and the reason that this tells a story is because all of the cards in Root represent um, the foxes and birds and bunnies and mice that actually make up this forest. They represent your contacts and your friends and favors you have to call in, uh, people you know, all of this stuff. And so uh, in this example, you can kind of tell this neat little story about how you march in with your troops, uh, put down people who support the cause, and this tax collector that was once aligned with you stands back and goes, whoa, I, would, I didn't sign up for this. Um, and so the tax collector... Um, goes and joins the alliance essentially and so just with this very simple mechanical um a uh, series of a token getting removed and a card getting transferred you can tell some pretty f fluid and interesting stories uh, and so that's an example of how we use um, our components uh, to tell stories in a very elegant way and a way that makes sense and now let's talk about one way that it really just does not make sense. Uh, and that's in a system called crafting. Um, so crafting, uh, the first thing that you need to know about crafting is that crafting lets you get the thing on the bottom of the card. That's basically all that you need to know to start out. So you have your suit on the top, and then you have this effect on the bottom that you can craft. So you can craft this travel gear if you want. 
Um, and the idea here is that if you have, um, you know, the right workshops, you can basically just get this effect. You say, okay, well, if I need a bunny, shown by that bunny at the bottom left corner, if I need a bunny and I have a bunny workshop, I can make this travel gear. You just basically look at the pieces that you have on the map, and that tells you whether or not you can make, uh, you can craft this card. Um, but the thing is, is that whenever you explain this to somebody, um, almost uh, always what happens is that they'll like look at the workshop that you're using to craft the thing, they'll like look back at the card, and then they'll say something like, "But what do I do? Like, what am I actually doing?" Um, and the disconnect here is that we're talking about this idea of crafting, this very physical, very embodied process. And when they're saying, what do I do? Um, I think really what's beneath that question is, where's the feedback? What is actually telling me that I'm crafting something? How do I represent in this world that I'm actually doing something with this workshop? And so because you don't have that physical connection between that workshop and that thing that you're making, you're losing out on that storytelling. Whereas in the previous story of the sympathy in the card, at every step of the way, there is a change in the game state in, that, in all of the components that are in that story. In this case, you just don't have that with the workshop. Um, and so the critical word here is feedback. So a way that you could provide feedback in the situation is to prompt people to actually flip the token over to another side. Now, this is a fiddly solution, and unfortunately, it actually reduces design space in certain ways. So it's not perfect, and we ended up opting not to go this direction. Today, we still live with some of the consequences of that, and it's, it's, it's still up in the air about whether it was the correct decision. But um, going back and showing people, teaching people how to craft by saying you can rotate the piece a bit or you can, um, you know, tr you can basically as long as you allow them to show that they've used this piece in some sort of physical way, the teaching seems to click much more smoothly than without. Um, and so feedback is an extremely important part of learning and user experience that can sometimes be hard to pull off in board games without causing other consequences that you don't want, like reductions in design space. Uh, and in this situation, the reduction in design space was, now it means that you can't have components that have different backsides other than this, um, this crafted side. So we ended up later uh, making a faction that had pieces that had two different sides. Um, and did unique things. And so in doing something like this, you're kind of cutting yourself off from other circumstances. So you kind of have to be careful about uh, where you introduce this feedback and whether it's going to be impacting your later design process. Uh, and a connected topic to this is uh, affordances. Um, you know, I'm talking about affordances of the front sides and back sides of these pieces and what they let you do in the design space. Um, but affordances have um, many, many um, connections to user experience, um, some of which you probably know about already. The classic example of the affordance being a trash can. So in this case, the trash cans have these wide open mouths, but the uh, recycling can uh, only has a uh, cylinder uh, enclosed space that only allows for a can to go through it. And so affordances are these tools that user experience designers can use to basically force people to go down the correct path of interacting with the object that you have. And so one example of this in board games um, is double layer boards. So this game is called Scythe. Um, and you can see here that the pieces actually slot into um, the specific parts on this player board that they're meant to go. They can only go in the place that they're meant to go. And so this is a, an excellent afford, use of affordances to drive people toward basically the correct answer. Um, now, we don't have these 
this kind of physical affordance in root for reasons that I won't get into here. But one thing that I do want to talk about are these things that we use in root called affordance prompts. This is kind of a made up word, but I think it, uh, I think it applies here. So what do I mean by affordance prompts? Well, basically there are many parts of the uh, graphic design of this game where pulling off a piece or putting on a piece will prompt people to do something specific. So uh, in this case, if you pull off one of these workshops, you are immediately prompted to score two points. So basically by hiding and revealing different interface elements as you interact with the game, at the point of interaction or point of use, you can prompt people to do something. And this is a very, very effective way to make sure that people follow the rules. Um, it's much easier than, say, writing it in a piece of text, you know, underneath these workshops saying, hey, every time you remove a workshop from here, you score two points. It's uh, better put at the point of use exactly where you're interacting with that interface um, because your player will be focused on that point of the board, and so it'll be much harder to miss. Um, but there's a problem with this. Um, and the problem is that um, this cuts both ways. So uh, this gets into false affordance prompts. And so basically, if we imagine the question, all right, when I put this workshop back on the same track, this track, uh, when I used it before, when I pulled this workshop off, I gained two points. Does this affordance prompt imply that I lose two points when I put this workshop back on the track? And that's a tricky question. There's no way for the interface to answer it immediately. And we actually ran into plenty of problems in earlier printings where people, a lot of people did actually think um, that they lost points when they put it back on, even though we had mentioned in the rules in various places, um, we, we, or specifically we hadn't said anything about losing points. And so when you're using affordance prompts, um, sort of great power comes with great responsibility. You do need to state ex quite explicitly um, that no, these affordance prompts don't work in the reverse way. So you need to be very careful about using powerful prompts on your interfaces because people may assume that they work in both directions, even if you only intend for them to work in one direction. Uh, so I want to give you uh, one more example of a false prompt, which was kind of hilarious, and thankfully we caught this one in development. Uh, so here is the board for one of our expansion factions called the Corvid Conspiracy. These, uh, you know, bomb-throwing crows, essentially. And the point, the part of this board that I want to point your attention to is this crafted items box up here in the top right. So here's that box. And one thing that happened during development was that um, just because we kind of needed the space, uh, I squished this box down a little bit. And doing this, I thought, oh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. You know, it's just a smaller box, but everything about it otherwise is the same. Uh, but the problem was, was that this uh, crafted items box was exactly the size of three item tokens. And so when we put this out to blind playtesters to test, the first thing that came back was, okay, so the smaller box, it only holds three items, right? It's smaller. And this is basically like my expression. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, no, obviously it doesn't. And so I, you know, kind of brushed it off. I did the bad user researcher thing. I kind of brushed it off. And then the next day, when we did a bunch more blind tests, it just happened again and again and again. And so this was a very, very consistent result where people were reading in um, this difference, this box being smaller, um, even though nothing, at no point did we say anything about it having an item limit, the mere fact of this uh, element being smaller compared to the other ones sent a message 
sent this implied affordance that no, in fact, this faction in particular could only hold three items, whereas other ones could hold more. So it's very, very important to keep an eye on your implied prompts based on the design of your interface elements. Um, and thankfully, some of these things are less of a problem in video games specifically. Um, a lot of games now use very, very fine-tuned and juicy feedback. Hearthstone is the one that comes to mind immediately for me, where, you know, the game does a really good job of telling you, like, okay, well, if I pull this card over a certain part of my interface, you know, it's prompting me with certain animations or certain shaders or other things that I can do particular things with this card or particular things with this other piece. So as video game designers, um, you have many more options uh, for the kind of feedback that helps you write around these ideas of uh, implied affordances. But there still are some things in video games, um, uh, implied affordances, that you have to watch out for in video games that you don't have to in board games. Um, an example might be if you put a big red button on a piece of cardboard in a board game, you know, nobody's going to assume that that's, like, an actual functional piece of your interface, probably, and start to, like, literally try to press it on your board game. Um, but you could put a big red button on a video game interface, and uh, you would have to worry a lot about the implied affordance there. Um, you know, there, uh, given nothing else, people very well might assume that that's actually a functional element. So depending upon the context um, and depending upon what kinds of feedback you can give, you need to be careful about different sorts of applied affordances. So next thing I want to talk about is context. Um, and I'm going to start it out by just giving this very famous optical illusion. Most of you have probably seen this. Um, this is the uh, duck-rabbit illusion. Um, so, you know, some of you might see a duck, some of you might see a rabbit here, depending upon how you're looking at it. Um, and so this is an example of context unsteadiness, where um, you can sort of shift back and forth between these two interpretations um, based on the conditions that they're in. Um, and a very important thing to add to this concept that I only learned fairly recently, a couple years ago, was just how much context matters uh, in concept unsteadiness. And the example for the uh, duck-rabbit il illusion is that um, around Easter, people think that it's a rabbit more than they do at other times of year. So they don't even need to be shown Easter eggs. They don't, they don't need to be primed in any way to think about rabbits other than just it kind of being in the air, that Easter is nearby. So context in tons and tons of forms really matter in how we interpret what we're seeing. Um, and so this applies quite a bit in usability and user experience in board games and other kinds of games. Context really matters a lot. Um, and so I'm going to give you an example of how that's true. So this is a very early uh, prototype version of one of the factions, and I want to direct your attention to this top part of the board that says scoring victory points. Um, and so early on in development, um, we had this idea that we might include a sort of reference for how you would score with a given faction on the faction board. And the reason for this, again, is that in root, the factions are asymmetric. Uh, you know, you score points in different ways. And so we thought, yeah, it might actually be useful for people to just always have it right there. You know, if they get confused about how to do things, they will just have that reference right there. But the problem is, is that when we went into our usability testing, uh, what we constantly found was that there was a confusion about whether this was a prompt or whether this was a reminder. And so what I mean by a prompt is some people would think, okay, well, I see that I'm scoring victory points in these particular ways, uh, and I'm 
uh, being prompted to do it on one part of the board. And then this area up here at the top of the board, the scoring victory points pane, is also saying it. So does that mean that I score points twice for doing it? Or do I only score points once? And so they were interpreting this as another literal prompt to do something, rather than just a general reminder that, hey, if you're ever confused, here are the basic ways that you score points. So by and large, people, when they saw this, would think that it's a prompt. Um, and there's a pretty simple explanation for this, which is, well, basically everything on the board is a prompt to do something. So naturally, it makes sense that if pretty much everything is a prompt, why not this too? This, you know, it makes sense that this would be a prompt. Um, so context matters. And so what we ended up doing was we got rid of this um, reminder on the board, and we shuttled it off to its complete own component, these, these overview cards for the factions that you hand out at the beginning of the game. And when this description of how you score victory points is put into this new context, people just by and large understood that this is a reminder. This isn't something that's doubling up on victory points you're scoring. This is just something to help you out. Um, and the reason being, it's all a reminder. It is packaged in a format that makes, um, makes it clear that it's a reminder, and it is consistently a reminder. So the context here supports understanding much better than the context in the, on the board in the, in the previous iteration. Um, so moving on, talking a little bit more about context, um, I want to talk more broadly about Root's audiences and how that informed our product design, rules writing, all kinds of things. So Root... Um, it's an interesting game. Uh, it is, we designed it as a way for people who aren't that familiar with the wargaming or generally co direct conflict gaming genre of board games, a way for people who aren't really familiar or comfortable with that genre to get into it. We wanted to provide an access point for the larger audience um, while also still being meaty for the people who really were into war games. Um, and so the first natural thing to do in such a situation is to create different sets of materials to fulfill those different audiences. And so when we shipped Root, um, we included basically three things. We included a reference manual, you know, a very strict um, you know, very literal rules document, the law of root. We also included a smaller, um, much more illustrated, lots of examples, uh, learn to play guide that would be friendlier for people um, getting into wargaming who didn't want to slog through very dry rules. Then we also put in a walkthrough. So we put in a double-sided sheet walkthrough that basically walked the players through their first two turns. And so, you know, uh, we really wanted to provide all of these different avenues um, for, for people so that, you know, they could tune their learning experience based on, you know, the context that they were coming from. Um, because, you know, we didn't just want people coming in from simpler games and looking at this giant, very dry document going, wait, how do I, how do, I do this? Um, but unfortunately, what happened was that um, a lot of people did end up coming in from uh, audiences that were not uh, primarily war game players, and they did start learning the game using this um, using this document. Um, and although a lot of people loved it, a lot of people hated it. Um, there were some pretty bad flame wars on our forums, a lot of people disagreeing about whether the rulebook was good or not, um, to the point where I definitely had to step into a few of these threads and say, okay, calm down, we're just talking about rules here. You know, this is not the end of the world. Um, you know, some people would say, you know, just don't think about it too hard. 
literally just follow the rules. They'll treat you right. That's what I did. It's fine. And then another contingent of people um, basically said, I do not like this rule book because you have to read it completely literally. And so for some people, that may strike you as being a very odd statement that you have to read things literally in a rule book. Um, but this really is a clash of two ways of thinking about rules and about reading rule books. Um, it's the case of, you know, not being able to, you know, see the water that you're swimming in. It's the famous David Foster Wallace um, speech about, uh, you know, you, you can't understand the water that you're swimming in. You know, two fish are going along and one says, how's the water today? And the other one says, what water? So uh, this is really a case of competing norms of different communities. Um, is specifically what you might call decoupling norms and contextualizing norms, where one group of people really do, really do just take the literal word of what is written and are comfortable with completely disconnecting um, things that they've experienced in other games, uh, genre conventions. Um, they're really comfortable with just reading the literal word. Um, and then there's another group of people who do use context much more um, than, than others. Um, and both of these groups of people are in the, in the right. They are both entitled to their way, way of reading. Um, but they come to clash when, uh, when they realize that other people just do not read rules in the same way. Um, you know, the people coming from the wargaming communities are very, very used to extremely dry, very literal, textbooky with many fewer pictures sorts of manuals. Um, you know, very dry at least until you add in some jokes about um, dictators and airstrikes and things like that. And so we had a problem here being that we had these two audiences and we didn't do due diligence on actually uh, teaching people how to read these different documents. You know, if you, we bring in certain audiences who aren't familiar with a particular format, it is on us to show them, to show them how this document is designed and how it's meant to be used. And so in later versions of Root, we do include this little, um, you know, basically how to read this document um, for people coming in who might not be familiar with this format. Um, it, it basically s explicitly states some of the unspoken assumptions of the wargaming community that are used in this document. So the other thing that we improved from earlier printings to the next was um, our walkthrough. And although many people, similar to the, the reference document, although many people really liked this, a lot of people got um, caught out because in this document, it shows you how to play. You know, it walks you through your turns. It says, okay, do this, do this, do this. And it describes what is happening but it does a poor job of why things are happening or why people are making certain decisions. So I cannot uh, tell you, I cannot overemphasize how important context is to many audiences. And so in later printings, we expanded this walkthrough, provided lots and lots of information about like, not just why you can do certain things, or broad overviews of certain systems, but also strategic considerations, how things link into other systems, just a general fleshing out of the why and the how. So context just really, really matters, especially when you're bringing different audiences together. And in the larger scope of things, um, you know, as um, as publishers in video games continue to make games that stretch out to wider and wider audiences and even stretching particularly intricate games to wider and wider audiences, um, we, we need to 
um, do a good job of creating context-rich resources in lots of forms. So one publisher that I would point out that's doing a really good job uh, of this is Paradox. Um, so I'll admit that when I played Crusader Kings 2 back in the day, I kind of bounced off it. It was a little... It was a little bit too, I was a little bit uh, too in over my head, I must admit. But with Crusader Kings 3, uh, over the past two or three years, Paradox has been doing a truly wonderful job, not only of making sure that their tutorials are well written and informative, but also just creating this really, really nice framework of Discord channels, wikis, how to play videos, system introductions, just all kinds of um, support structures for people to learn in different ways. So they're able to take these incredibly intricate grand strategy games and really put them out to wide audiences because they create these high quality, broad-based, context-rich um, resources. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about quickly is cognitive load. Um, so cognitive load is basically just how hard do you have to think to understand something in this game. Uh, and Root is a very intricate game. Um, it has a lot of rules. Uh, the rules are somewhat different for all the factions, and so it's a challenge. Um, and so we had to figure out a way to teach this properly and to introduce people to the game properly. And one way that we did this in early testing is by using synchronous teaching. Um, and so the way that this looked like was we had these overview cards that I alluded to earlier. And basically, um, we would give each faction, you know, each player of the faction, one of these overview cards. And then we would say, okay, play around. And then once you're done playing around, you're going to take this overview card and you're basically going to read from this to introduce yourself as a faction. So we thought, okay, well, there's a little bit of a role-playing element you know, it stops the table for a second to really start to integrate the other factions. You know, we thought this would be, this would be great. You know, you could say, all right, I'm the cats. And the bird player would be like, all right, cool. Hate you. And now you're going to tell me why I hate you and how I can fight you and things like that. Um, but when we went out to various environments to test the system, including bars, which I would recommend everyone to test games in. They're great. Um, we realized that in many environments, this kind of teaching strategy was really poor. Um, because you might imagine, bars are loud. Uh, so, you know, the player would start talking about their faction, and other people just, like, couldn't really hear them that well. Uh, but it went even beyond that. You know, even though the bar was loud and dark, you know, it's poor conditions for learning a game, which is what makes it really good for user testing. Um, beyond that, even, there was a problem simply of cognitive load. Uh, people would just zone out. People were absolutely not prepared to learn about the other factions. Root is a game where a lot of that first game, you're pretty much just going to be focusing on yourself. Um, there, there are enough rules where most of your brain space is going to be taken up figuring out your faction, figuring out what your strategies are, figuring out what you want to do. And so to be forced to learn about another faction at a particular time, for a lot of people, they just weren't ready for it. And so between um, the con bad context like bars and between the cognitive load, it's just not doing a good job of teaching. And so what we then tested and ended up settling on was an asynchronous teaching strategy. So instead of one person getting a card and then the other people being read two, we basically just decided, okay, we give everyone a card for every faction. They can read it. They don't need to listen over, over to someone else. There's still the problem of dark settings, but it's a little bit less problematic than, um, than noise unless it's pitch black. But more importantly, people can do it on their own time. Um, and so basically, um, you know, people can get around that cognitive load problem. Um, and 
this is very interesting for couch co-op games. Um, Jackbox does a great job uh, in Drawful and other games of doing synchronous teaching, of teaching everyone at the same time. Um, but there are also games such as Push the Button, again a Jackbox game, where they do asynchronous teaching on the phones that you're playing on. And so they're not teaching you on the screen in front of you, they're teaching you in your personal space on your phone. And so we, as games, uh, couch co-op games like this, uh, where people have like a small screen and a big screen, as these games get more intricate, and I hope they get more intricate, I want to see, you know, a root level complexity couch co-op game with split controllers. You know, as we amp up the complexity, we have to think about what are the optimum teaching strategies? You know, how do we do good asynchronous teaching versus synchronous teaching? Um, and that's it. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation. Uh, I'll open it up for questions, uh, and I will post this on my website along with the photo credits for this talk. So thanks again.